We're live. We are live. We are live. We always think we're live, and then we have to check for a minute. So, <laughs> I think we just skipped that whole thing and just talk about something else. Talk about what? I don't know. Something interesting. Well, you're the most interesting here, Keenan. Let's let's hear. <laughs> Somebody say. Let's hear your chat. Normally, people keep us right, don't they? And they start to say hi, and we know. Yeah. And they join in. So, hey, everyone! If you've just joined us, pop into the comments below. Come and say hello. Tell us where you oh. are in the world and what you've been up to this week or we definitely are live because I can see it here. So we'll just get a wee minute to let everyone pop in and then we'll get started. I can sing some hold music for you if you like. Could you do that? Thank you. I definitely would. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants that. They do kind of need a function for that though, don't they? Where there's a button so music mm -hmm. plays or something. Yeah. Or, would be or nice. we could be like, a bit more organized and actually organize that. Now. We should, you know, we should get a musician on here to do a little opening for us every time. That's a good we idea. Should. We could do that. A little piano kind of some well, lovely yeah. music. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Well, we've That's got people good, coming. I don't know why it's taking like week eight for us to be. <laughs> 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 We're doing this for four months, but yeah, let's do that now. Yeah. <laughs> we can still change it. We can change it. Keep it fresh. Welcome everyone who's joining us. Come in and say hello down below. And Rach, whenever you want to get started, yeah. you get started. Yeah, I'll well, leave it up to you. I can't see if um I can't see anybody today, so I'll keep you guys right. I don't know. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's so good to see you all. It always feels like it's the fastest two-week turnaround. And then all of a sudden it feels like we haven't seen everybody here for ages. So we're very, very pleased to have you. I'm Rachel Brown I have from Creative Entrepreneurs Club. And today we're going to talk real quick about the aim of the series and what we're hoping to cover. And then we're going to jump into an interview with Gillian Stewart, who we are delighted to have because Gillian is a prize winning bookbinder running a studio called Juju Books from Glasgow's East End and Counts McAllen Whiskey, Idris Elba, and the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia among her clients. Andrew, I'm going to hand over to you now. Fantastic. So thanks to everyone uh, for joining. Um, this is now the eighth in a series of these live stream sessions where we've partnered up. So I'm Andrew. I'm the founder of Made Brave. We partnered with Rachel and the team at Creative Entrepreneurs Club. We back at the beginning of all the COVID panic um, and we've been getting together to try and help and support the creative industries and do our little bit towards um, keeping us all kind of, I suppose, um, positive through all this um, and trying to make as many sort of resources for everyone as well. So if this is your first time listening, um, we have a job board. Well, on here, actually, if you, if you go up onto the search tab, and you search creative industry COVID support. There is a LinkedIn group. There's about three and a half thousand people have joined that group and they're helping each other out, sharing jobs, um, bits of advice, a bit of morale and um, a network. So if, you've, if you're trying to find um, a little bit of help and support just right now, jump on in there. Um, the other bit of resource that we have for you is that Rachel and a team at Creative Entrepreneurs Club kindly gifted their platform, which was usually a paid for platform. And you can head over to creativeentrepreneursclub.co.uk. Um, and on there, you're able to access free one-to-one -one support. Um, I'm offering some of my time. Uh, Keenan is offering some of his time. Rachel is offering some of her time. And there's a whole host of other uh, helpful and kind people um, who um, specialize in, some, in, in many different things. They're operations, finance, legal, creative. And you can just go and pick um, brains if you're just needing someone to help you guide you on your way at the moment. Uh, but this session um, is very much about creativity and inspiring some creativity in you all. We believe there's creativity in everyone at Made Brave. And so in the series, we're um, bringing in different creative people who have inspired us in the hope that they inspire you. So um, I'll leave it with that. Um, and then, oh, in fact, sorry, in our last session, if you didn't catch it, we had the fantastic Stephanie Boyle, who's a freelance copywriter and content strategist. Um, we covered a range of topics with Steph, including her approach to content writing, how to develop content strategies, and how she has used that in work with brands <coughs> like Tens and Nude Finance. Um, if you're interested in seeing that episode or any of the previous episodes, you can jump onto the Creative Entrepreneurs Club website, creativeentrepreneursclub.co.uk, or you can jump over to Made Brave YouTube channel. So just go onto YouTube and search for Made Brave.
Cool. So for those of you who are just joining us, we're doing a quick interview here with Gillian Stewart. Now, Gillian is an owner and bookbinder at her studio, Juju Books, based in Glasgow's East End. That's me too, Gillian. Made brave as well. And there, uh, Gillian makes bespoke books and boxes by hand for artists, designers, and all-round book lovers. Gillian uses traditional skills and innovative contemporary designs while sharing these skills through workshops. I'm going to ask you about that, Gillian. I'm desperate to get involved in something. It sounds so awesome. Gillian has a background in illustrating and spending almost six years working with a range of clients to produce illustrations across promotional, artist impression artworks, and children's book illustrations. Combined with experience as a workshop leader at Dunoon Borough Hall, what? Where Gillian assisted visiting artists with the planning and delivery of workshops in schools involving various mediums. And you can see Gillian's wealth and experience in the creative industries. We're super delighted to have you here, um, as, as well as your plants, Gillian. We have to kind of bring that in. <laughs> Gillian, bookbinding and plants. So <laughs> to kick us off, I'm super interested. Can you give us a bit of insight about your background and especially how did you become interested in bookbinding? Yes, absolutely. It is fairly weird and niche. Um, <laughs> so for sure, I can explain that. Um, so I went to GSA where I studied illustration. So there we were making, we we're working with narratives a lot. And um, so you'd often make something that would take the form of a book. Um, and we did a little bit of, of book binding there. And I just became more interested in the form of the book and the varieties of, of how you can make a book than actually what I was putting into it. Um, and I think I was just, I, I was a much better book binder than I am an illustrator, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so that's when it really got interesting for me. And um, I kind of, after art school, I was an illustrator for a while and did some traveling and faffing about and worked in bars and stuff. And then I got a traineeship in uh, bookbinders in Glasgow. And that's when it just sort of clicked for me um, where I became really interested in the, the very precise technical nature of bookbinding, where like a millimetre, a fraction millimetre becomes really important um, and how it becomes this very efficient, elegant way of of communicating a subject, whatever that is in the book. Um, so it's this crossover between what the book is saying and the contents and how the structure or the form of it can enhance that or change how we feel about it when we interact it with it that became really interesting for me. I feel that's a bit of an RC answer. No, no. <laughs> What's the process? Like, because I look at it and I go, yeah, you just open a book. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's more yeah, there's, than that. There's, there's thousands of ways that you can make a book. Um which I think is what's cool is that I'll never know all of them. Um, but I'll usually, so I usually work with um, clients on a one-off book or short runs of like higher end books. So the prints will come from the printer, usually flat, um, and then they'll get folded into sometimes sections, which is like a little mini booklet. And then there's loads of different ways that those are sewn together into a book block, which is kind of like a naked book. Um, and I use sewing because it's really durable, and it means that the book can open flax. I think that's very important when you're reading a book. You want to be able to open it. You don't want to be like fighting to get into the spine mm -hmm. of the book. And then once it is the book block, you can trim it with a guillotine. Um, and then the cover options are, yeah, you can do loads with the cover design. So that's kind of like a standard, that would be a standard hardback book. But there's also ways that you can use like carbon rods and brass and fabric and acrylic and loads of really unusual materials and sort of wacky structures to bind it together I feel like I should have a slideshow for you sorry. I know yeah <laughs> Phil, Phil have you got any books there that you can show I, our I actually audience don't, I'm really sorry I'm at, I'm at home for, for the viewers at home and um, my studio is really noisy and there's a, a children's photographer next door with screaming babies today so I thought I would take you all home so that we could hear <laughs> each other um so I know it's really yeah. hard to, to look, but on my Instagram, there's a waffle on loads about like different structures. Yeah, so maybe cool. maybe Keenan will pop your Instagram up and while while people are listening along, they can go jump on and have a look. Because I think only once you see your books do you start understanding the sort of high-end quality that they have. And now I I I started out as a print guy, so I, you know, made brave, obviously. I've I was a designer in my past, um, but before I um just cry into Excel spreadsheets all day. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> which is my job now, really. Um, but no, um, you know, I kind of, um, you know, a big part of my early career was in the, the, the print process as well. And actually, Stephen, who is our Made Brave Operations Director, he can actually, he can tell 
which press um, a piece of design for is by smelling the <laughs> smelling. Wow, smelling. isn't that and, amazing? That's print geekery, isn't it? Um, but cool. I suppose um, you know, Jillian, I'm sort of uh, interested. Um, you know, you, you've done work with the Macallan and such like, and I suppose from your perspective, like, what, what are the kind of most exciting projects, or is there a project that you've done that has is the perfect project for you? Mm, that's a good question. That's a very good question. Um, I, I, yeah, I've done quite a lot of, I've been really lucky. I've had a variety of projects for bigger clients and smaller clients and large orders and small orders. But I think my favourite type um, of of work is when degree show season comes around for art students mm. um, because they might, yeah, I've worked with textile students, photography students, and graphic design students, and um, they'll have worked really hard on this project, and they yeah. need a really special binding for it, and they care so much about it, um, and and they appreciate so much the the finished book that that's really rewarding. Um, it's a lot of pressure because sometimes they'll have printed something that there's only one copy of, and um, mm -hmm. being an art student, I understand that I also leave things to the last minute, so um, there's often not time to reprint anything. So it's a lot of pressure, but then it's fine. Everything goes great, and then you have a gen at the end of the day. Um, but they're also really challenging because they asked for some wild books that sometimes aren't physically possible, but always really make me think about, well, if it's not possible, why not? Or is there a way that I could make this happen? Mm. Um, so I think that's my favourite type of job to work on are the art students because they're mm. always cool and groovy. <laughs> so what, I can what, is the most, Natalie, what is the most challenging technique that you've done? So you mentioned like brass mm. and you mentioned, yeah, I'm assuming in rods and you I imagine you can use leather mm. and you can use paper. You can mm -hmm. use all kinds of things. Can you can you paint a visual picture for us? Sure. I think I think the most difficult would be like a traditional what's called fine binding, yeah. where you have a book block that's been letterpress printed. Um, so it's usually quite expensive, and there's a short, you know, there's a small quantity of them that are made. So you know that the book that you're working with is quite precious, um, and then you can take weeks to bind it together. Often I'll use hand dyed leather and layers of leather on top of each other that are it's called pairing when you when you take a skin of leather and then pair it down to a fraction of a millimetre and then you put that on top of other layers of leather um, and then you use gold tooling sometimes printing methods and then you have to pair all around so you'll, you'll get a bit of leather that's kind of like the if you imagine like an old jotter cover in primary school when you would cover your jotter with a bit of wallpaper it's like that but with leather and you have to be really accurate with how thin you make each part um, and the process of putting that around the book is really nerve-wracking and terrifying and it involves lots of swearing and sweating. <laughs> and <laughs> that's probably the most difficult, the most challenging method, but that's not something that people usually, I don't get asked to do that very often, that's usually my own designs, but sometimes I'll incorporate leather into a client's book. Um, so I think that's probably, it's, it's the most challenging because it's quite technically skilled and very time consuming. Um, yeah. But therefore I, I, it's rewarding. And, and do you work on your own, Jillian, or do you have a team that you work with? How, how's this I happen? usually just work on my own. Mm -hmm. um, I've hired people for, for larger jobs. If there's like a huge run that needs to be out quickly, I'm quite lucky that I know a few other bookbinders that I can call on that are happy to work um, with me. Um, but at the moment, I'm just working by myself, and I quite like that. I'm a bit of a hermit. <laughs> <laughs> but ideally, I would love to have someone come in uh, and be an apprentice at one point because it's quite hard to learn bookbinding. So I'd like to be able to offer that to somebody. But it's not something that I can do at the moment. But maybe in a few years, I'd like to be able to um, show someone else. The yeah. Book. And I'm fascinated is where do you find master bookbinders? I mean, it sounds like we should go on a pilgrimage somewhere to hunt down <laughs> master bookbinders. I, I was imagine there's these like, you know, somewhere hidden in Rome and all the rest of it. So, yeah, they're just in caves that are shaped like books, you can open the book. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, it's a good question. It's quite difficult. Um, there's not any apprenticeships in the UK anymore for bookbinding. Um, the last ones were in Windsor Castle and that's just finished. Um, so definitely is a challenge. I'm quite lucky that there's a bookbinder called Tom McEwen who lives in Irvine, who is an absolute legend. And I managed to get some funding to learn from him. And that was just luck that there was someone so close by. Um, there's an organization called Designer Bookbinders, which are a UK based 
organisation and they have a list of fellows and fellows are kind of recognised as the best in the UK so that's like a good database um, and then there's a few schools in Europe who get tra uh, not travelling book binders but they get book binders to travel to them <laughs> to teach <laughs> who are um, known for being really highly skilled so it took a bit of it did take a bit of of um of digging when I wanted to really take it seriously and get better it mm -hmm. did take a lot of research to find these places but when you tap into it, it's a very small world and everybody knows each other, um, which is quite nice. Um, and I suppose, um, you know, over the, over the fat last few years, you know, you know, when, when digital is becoming more prominent, more prominent and everything's online, um, you know, it'd be easy to think that, you know, as humans, well, that's it, printing's gone. But I think, you know, there's something really nice, you know, and I think as humans, we're tactile creatures. We like we like to hold things in our hands and that sort of third dimension or fourth dimension that, you know, the book gives you um, is obviously, you know, you know something I, I don't quite think it's dead yet as such you know and, and in terms of like we've seen from vinyl sales over the last few years the vinyl sales have actually increased um, in 2019 but I wonder because of COVID and you know touching things and do you think you'll have an effect or have you seen an effect or have you had to make mm. any changes to how you know you know I suppose how where your customers are from and what you're doing? That's a good question um, I feel like it's I'm definitely so finding my feet right now with the COVID situation um, and and how that will affect the business in the longer term. Just try not to think too much about that. <laughs> um, but I do I do think that just talking about how, you know, I, I think a lot of people worried that when Kindle came out, it would be the end of books. But um, I think what it really means is that when people are making a project around a book, that when it's made into a physical thing, it's more important and people end up creating things that are more special and a bit more precious. So mm -hmm. for me, that's quite good because that's the sort of books that I mm -hmm. make for clients are usually ones that they need, to, you know, it's for a special project. So I don't feel that that, I think if anything, it's probably left me with some more interesting projects. Um, in terms of what the future of physical books will be in a world where we're not supposed to touch anything or anyone, <laughs> um, I'm not sure. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to scare you there. That, 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 wrong. Uh, that, took us, that took us down an avenue we didn't need to go there. That <laughs> was. Today. Not today. Uh, I, I so actually I'm tell. Gonna, oh, sorry. I'm going to pull us right back, Julian, because what everybody, I just, you know, what everybody wants to know is the project with Idris Elba, because that's so <laughs> like My that good pal. My good pal. Like, what did you make? What's going on? Um, so I made his wedding invitations which were some really complex boxes. There were 150 boxes that were sort of A5 size, but quite deep. And they were foil blocked with a logo that was made for the wedding. Again, this is all on my Instagram. Um, <laughs> so they were made to hold an invitation and they are made to hold a drawer with um, a special gift for each guest. And they were on the, I was told that they were, they chartered a jet for all their guests to go to Morocco and each person got one of these on their seat. So, I'm sure that they were touched by some very exciting people, <laughs> but um, but he doesn't know I exist. We're not good pals, but um, that was a that was a that was a project that I just got from being on social media, and an illustrator that was working on it found me through a hashtag, and I resisted using Instagram for so long. It made me so cringe, but I'm so glad I did because I wouldn't have got it otherwise. Yeah, um, but it was a quite that was turned around in like five weeks, which was a bit mad to be honest, and <laughs> terrifying. But it all went okay. And so what and is was... your Instagram for anyone that's watching just now? It's at juju.books. There we go. Um, and they were they were blue and yellow boxes, so you can just scroll until you see some blue and yellow. Mm. Keenan, maybe maybe by the the powers that be, you could pull our, um, Jillian's Instagram <gasps> up just now. We'll share your screen, maybe. This is what Keenan's good at, sharing screens. Technology, great. <laughs> sure, we do need some mid music, some kind of... Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, pressure. no pressure, Keenan. Um, we'll keep talking while that happens. <laughs> yeah, so I suppose, Jill, in, in terms of, like, you know, where, where do you get your inspiration? Is there any other designers that you follow or did you have any mentors or, you know, are, are you one of these people that kind of um, has your own distinct sort of gut feel and you're just heading off in your own direction or do you, do you take a little bit from everywhere? Where, where, where do you sit? Hmm. I am definitely inspired by there's a good few bookbinders that um, 
I remember getting really excited when I found out they existed. Um, because to say, yeah, I think when people think of book binding, they think it's all brown leather and marble paper and dusty books. And actually, there's this really cool world of wild, there we go. interesting kind of stuff. Oh, there we go. There they are. <laughs> Here we are. Amazing. Yep. <laughs> um, there, I have my overflow. So I, I had some. Well, here we go. So this is from there. Yeah, there was so like there an little gifts inside of there. Is that what you're saying? Um, yeah. Which I didn't need. That was printed. And then a gift of a little key ring inside. Because with celeb weddings, you can't um, you can't send out an invitation beforehand. So people don't really know exactly where they're going. <laughs> so, um, they couldn't be frosted. It was a real insight into how, you know, how, how the other half was. <laughs> Oh. They look lovely. They look That's very cool. Nice. I really like them. Awesome. That's nice. Yeah, they were good. It was the first. That was the first big project that I'd managed on my own. Um, and it was oh my, what a relief when they got out okay and everything was fine. And what what, did, drive you, them. what did you learn then? So tell us if, for people that are watching, what are the tips and tricks? If that was the first one that was like big commission got to deliver because you, you can't have a commission like that and not deliver oh really no. so what what did you learn about it or what made you nervous all of that stuff give us the chat okay yeah i think i was definitely nervous that they would fall apart <laughs> <laughs> um so i spent quite a bit of time prototyping and that uh, tom McEwen, who i'd learned from he helped me sort of work out some technical things with that so that was really good to have someone with a bit more experience mm -hmm. I'm definitely not afraid of asking for help I'm quite honest that I, there's loads of stuff I don't know so I am happy to say somebody help me um, so yeah definitely don't be afraid to ask for help um, I could have made more money if I'd done it all myself but I would have had to have pulled ghosters every night so I hired people for that um, so I guess I was yeah don't be greedy <laughs> And, and then That's very tempting to like, mm, sort of long did the project take? Sorry, sorry. The project, that took five weeks. Five and weeks. for something like that, it would have been better to have had about three months. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> work there was. Um, and I had, uh, I like to plan. So I'd written out a schedule of what needed to be done by which point and tried to keep track of how long each stage took. And then just batch processed things. Um. Yeah, it was quite, I think I could have, in the end, we were going to ship it down to London before it went on, um, off to like the final client, but it just got so expensive that I ended up driving down <laughs> in a van. <laughs> Very slowly in the, the slow lane of the motorway, lest I crash. <laughs> I like the commitment, I like it. <laughs> <No>. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, and I think... Because the client that first approached me, the illustrator, um, she asked for prototypes with quite short notice. And I think I usually might have said no, but she asked me in such a nice way that I just did it. And that really taught me about dealing with other businesses and dealing with suppliers. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that you can, if you're just nice, um, mm -hmm. it goes a long way. Definitely. Definitely. Because it worked out. Looks brilliant. I love your stuff. So what is your favourite thing to work on, Gillian, when you're doing something like this? Do you have a favourite material? Do you have a favourite approach? Or is it just everything's a new experience, you just go for it? I think I really like working with material that's new to me. Okay. Um, I think there's definitely a satisfaction that comes from, for example, leather. That takes a long time to learn how to work with, and it took me a long time to not make a mess every time I used it. And there's a satisfaction that comes with that. But I think there's also like, if you use, so I'm, I'm using Tyvek at the moment, which can be dyed and tooled, but isn't a traditional bit binding material. And there's so much that I don't know about the way it behaves that if I'm using it in a binding, I quite like that it will tell me what to do sometimes. If you know what I mean, like I can't just decide, okay, the book's going to look like this because I'm using this material. It's that it's like an adventure. It's taking me on a journey, um, and I really like that. And uh, it doesn't, yeah, sometimes it goes wrong, but that's fine. And is that something that you think others 
should focus in on. You talk about prototyping, experimenting in a time like this where everybody feels the pressure and feels the pressure to get stuff out the door and deliver. But you're talking about new materials and experimenting. Do you think we should do more of that at this time? Do you think? I have personally found that really, really helped me. Um, because, I, yeah, I've also got caught up, especially money's a bit of a scary subject for a lot of businesses right now. So there is a temptation to, OK, if I've got a job on, just get that out the door as quickly as possible and not think about personal work. But, um, yeah, and at the start of lockdown, I just had this massive creative block. And what got me out of it was experimenting with um, prints and a new book structure. Um, and it just really, yeah, it really, really, really helped me. Yeah. So I would, if you, if you can. And do you and do you find that stuff sort of bring backs uh, sort of brings back um, the sort of clients that you're looking for as well? I mean, we we spoke to quite a lot of freelance creatives, and there tends to be quite a similar pattern of you know you do your own self initiated work, and then what and you put that out into the world, and then people tend to come back going, oh, I'm looking for something quite like that, a little bit like that, something like that, and it turns then so then you start to do the work that you actually want to get. Would you sort of agree with that or? Absolutely, yeah, and I think it's something that takes a bit of faith, doesn't it? Because you can't. You, I mean, sometimes you feel like you should be chasing work, making the things that you think people want, but it, yeah, it doesn't work like that sometimes. Yeah, I think you put out what what makes your heart sing, and kind of, you know, I, mm -hmm. I would even say like, you know, from speaking to a lot of creatives as well, is putting out unfinished work, just putting out ideas, things that you've started, ideas that you've started to explore, because usually someone else picks up and takes that idea and helps run with it, and you know, then that's that's bringing you work. I love, now I love these these boxes. Can you talk us through these that just popped up on this screen? Can I talk you through them? Yeah. What yes. These so these were these are a bit wild. Um, I got some funding last year to learn from a master box maker, mm -hmm. um, called Cor Ayrsons, who lives in the Netherlands, who is just like one of the best people at making boxes. Um, and boxes are something that goes kind of hand in hand with bookbinding because you make a nice book yeah. and then you want to put it in this box. And I really love making them. Um, so I made this while in his studio. So this is my own design that he gave me advice on how to manufacture something so complicated <laughs> so i kind of i wanted to design a box that was the the most ridiculous complex thing i could think of with angles that didn't make sense <laughs> um so the the black piece is like a tree that mm -hmm. floats down inside and there's a certain feel and there's a certain speed that that should go at yeah and that's something that i could only learn in person from him there's no way that you could really convey that um in a book and uh and, and so when you're doing this type of project there's the minimum runs is it just is it just you will do one for someone is it if they wanted or is it that you're mm -hmm. you know 50 or 100 or you know yeah so i can do runs between one and depending on the time scale like 250 um mm -hmm. most of the time it's between one and ten books for clients okay um which is it means that there's not a huge amount of I mean, yeah, there's. I feel like there's enough. I'm quite lucky. I do feel like there's enough work to keep me going. Um, and I don't know if that's just being in Glasgow or if I'm just lucky that there are sort of one-off special book projects Maybe because you're good. Maybe because you're good. No, because you're lucky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, but people can come and to just have one book made or I can have hunters. And if, if they want, if they want like a thousand, then I'd... I'd you know recommend them to go to a different like a trade binder or something that can handle bigger quantities fantastic so you also, only do really special focused pieces you don't do big runs of things it's, it's really it's handmade it's bespoke it's it's one off it's very special i mean I, yeah I, I think yes generally <laughs> quite, I, i'm quite lucky that i work in special projects i mean i do work on i have worked on projects that aren't maybe as creative or the you know isn't an artist book or something um but it just tends to be that because it's handmade it's a little bit more expensive to engage my services rather than you know a print shop so it tends to only be pro you know projects that are quite special mm -hmm. and i was fascinated when we were doing the intro um that you also do workshops and you're engaged in workshops so do you teach people how to do book binding I do, and it's something that I really love doing and that I'm really missing at the moment. Um, so I usually run about one or two workshops every month in non-COVID times. And uh, I love doing it. I love, you know, I'm waffling on about books right now. I could, I just love waffling about books to people who want to listen to me do that and learn about it. <laughs> um, and it, as I've seen before, it's quite hard to learn bookbinding. There's not a huge amount 
of opportunities, but there are quite a lot of people who want to learn bookbinding. Mm -hmm. um, I think people, it tends to, once people sort of get the bug, they tend to want to keep doing it. So it's something that I'm missing at the moment. I did my first Zoom workshop last week and it actually went well. I was quite skeptical that people wouldn't be able to get the processes um, or that it wouldn't, you know, make sense or there'd be something missing in the tactility. Um, and I do think that that is still, you know, there's something that's missing. But there was also, you know, because I had close-ups of my hands, there's also something extra that you get that you wouldn't get in a physical workshop unless you had a projector or something. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. And is that something you're going to think you're going to carry on doing? Maybe. That one was for portfolio core students at the art school, um, which I usually do every year. So they asked me to come back because their students um, go off and make really cool books. Um, mm -hmm. But I, so, and actually it was doing that workshop that made me think, oh, maybe there, maybe I could do, maybe it's not as bad as I thought it would be. So, mm -hmm. yeah, especially if lockdown's getting stricter, <laughs> maybe, maybe it'll be yeah. nice to do that. Well, it's just interesting to hear about them um, being, you know, being in the room is such an important part of your process because when lockdown happened, I don't think there was anybody left on the planet that wasn't getting zoomed out of their nut just like within about a week of, of stuff happening. So it's nice to hear actually that, that, you know, it's important to be in the room and it's important part of the creative process to be mm. touching and engaging and feeling the materials Um and so if it doesn't, if it's not your bag, it's not your bag. And I think that's important for other people to hear as well who are, who are sort of thinking about what is the way forward for your own organisation or your mm -hmm. own practice, your own business. You, you've got to find what's right for you and you've got to find what's right for your creative process in order to make that relevant and important. Because as you say, there's an, you've got enough work. You know, there are things that are, projects are happening and people are engaging. So you don't have to jump through every hoop to, to, to be successful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think, you, yeah, I'm also mindful that I don't want to try to, um, yeah, I've, try, I've tried to sort of get through COVID in a way that works for me, um, where I know that I could be making lots of, like, for example, like cheaper notebooks or something and just try and follow those of them. But I don't, I feel like I need to, like, protect my brand a wee bit because um, you don't want to get known for something that you don't want to carry on doing, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. I don't know if that sounds super arrogant. I don't know. I'm also kind of lazy, and I spent the first two months just not doing any books. So <laughs> <laughs> I just needed, I just needed a break. Um, but yeah. yeah, and and Gillian, we've we've usually got quite a lot of younger listeners, you know, and there's a lot of, um, I suppose, a lot of people finished courses at the moment, you know, try to figure out what their next step is and finding a job. I suppose if they were interested in doing what you do, is there any is there any advice that you could give just now, or or even? Sure. The, yeah. If they're interested specifically in bookbinding, um, it's quite hard to get. I'm just being honest, I'm not trying to put them off, but it's quite hard to get a traineeship um, in bookbinding. So if you see one come up, it might do. Just go for it because it's not like it will come around again next month. Um, if they really want to take it seriously, there's more bookbinders, more, co more companies that can take on a trainee where they'll teach you a lot from scratch um, in England especially mm. London, mm -hmm. um, but also you can make it work in Scotland. <laughs> um, yeah, I try, I try to find someone who can teach you in person because there's so much that you cannot learn from a book. So just find your nearest good bookbinder and ask them to teach you stuff. Um, there's loads of stuff on YouTube. There's lots of resources online. <laughs> You're going um, to be the nearest bookbinder. You're doing all that. I was going to say. <laughs> 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 I don't like, at all. Me. <laughs> <laughs> Just come and see me. Um, yeah. I do, I do think, because there's so many processes where, like, the way a box closes needs to feel right and it needs to sound right. And there's a certain type of air that needs to come out when it closes. And I don't know how you would convey that in a book. So I definitely find it useful learning from people. There's also uh, a <laughs> there's a level of training right here that you're just you're singing to the choir here, <laughs> Gillian. Yeah. A level okay. of that you're like, yeah, that has to close properly. Andrew and I are like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're getting real niche here. This right, niche yeah, yeah. Um, that. Totally niche. that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. There's also I think that there's a really nice. Um, 
I, I spend probably too much time on Instagram, but there's a lot of bookbinders on Instagram who share skills and knowledge and enthusiasm. And I've found that pretty nice because there's, there's been times where I've been stuck with a project that I'll message one of them and be like, how did you do this? So you just reach out and ask. We're all bookbinders. We're all friendly because there's so few really, of us. Like, this oh. might be a really silly question. And, I, and I'm not one for ever admitting this, a silly question, but presumably you work globally. Like you're not, yeah, you're based in Scotland and it's great. There's another guy in Irvine, news to me, that's brilliant, <laughs> finders everywhere. But um, but but presumably like it's, it's something that you send stuff all over the world. Yeah. yeah. I mean, most of my clients I think are in the west of Scotland, but I just, I sent a book to Russia yesterday. That was my first book to Russia. I'm just well, glad you didn't drive know. there, you know. I, just like, <laughs> I thought about it, I thought about it, but I decided it was safer in the post. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I think I have, yeah, I think, yeah, I've been quite lucky. Books are going to the States and Saudi and Russia. Um, it would be cool to get one in every country. That would be nice. Would. You should get that on Instagram, your bookbinding map of where you've been sending. <laughs> That's a nice idea. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm conscious I mean, of time and I'm just wondering if anyone that's listening has any questions for Gillian. So if you do, please pop them in the comments below. I'm sure she'll she'll happy to answer anything you have buzzing around in your head. Sorry, I feel like I just rambled at each question that you asked me. I'm so sorry. So what do you tell us? You were what do you want to tell us then about bookbinder? I could not genuinely listen to you all day. I collect books. I'm total geekery in this space. <laughs> <laughs> um but what so what what would you what would you be saying? What do you want everybody to know about the awesomeness of bookbinding or even Ooh. like your creative industry stuff? Because you do so much, you're being quite modest. <laughs> um oh gosh. Um books are cool. <laughs> Make them <laughs> get that up, Keenan. Make books anything are cool. Make them. Um what, or, or or about 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 cre creativity generally or about, I think yeah, you know, we're in like... quite tough times and, and I think, I, you know, there's so many brilliant, creative, talented people in Glasgow and the West Coast and in Scotland. I mean, us four are, you know, we all, our, all our businesses are based in the East End of Glasgow. So clearly that's the place to be um, in and when it goes, it goes off. But like, mm -hmm. there's so much talent here and people are nervous. And, and you know, I, I mm -hmm. always check my privilege every day of being able to still be a creative person when it's when it's a tough environment and I think you know it, it, it is exciting as well as challenging and and to hear somebody that can do something as niche and as specific as you you know doing it your own way and foraging ahead people can learn a lot from that that's awfully nice thank you <laughs> um yeah I definitely also feel like mega insanely lucky that I'm still able to do this and I think if look if this had all happened two years ago at the start of my business I would be doing something else I would have to have given up so I'm very lucky um I tell think us a bit about that, that though I'm going to jump in there tell us a bit about that is that about confidence or is that because you built up a better client base why do you feel that you you're, you're able it, to it, carry going um a confidence was a huge problem for me at the start of my business yeah. like it took me so long to give myself the permission to feel like I had a right to do what I wanted to do business and creative wise um and that just took loads of support from loads of people and help mm -hmm. and some therapy and some friends and like business mentors. Um, so yeah, and I was also working part-time when I started out the business. So it's only in the last year I've been able to do it full-time. Um, so I suppose advice wise, I would all just be nice to as many people as you come across, check your ego. <laughs> Um, and try and stay humble and friendly because Glasgow's tiny and if you're an arsehole everybody will know if you'll get anywhere <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's also like if in a place like Glasgow you'll end up working with friends and clients will become friends so it, there's a big crossover I think in the creative community and um, between work and you know friendships which is really cool. Um, and don't be afraid to ask for help because nobody knows everything and there's no point pretending that you know everything. Um, and the quickest way to find out something is to ask someone to tell you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably totally. my yeah, words no, of no, That's great. Um, and we've just had a question jump question in. in. Fire away. Yeah, here we go. Uh, it says, uh, 
I can't see who this is, um, but you know, uh, the question is, you know, how did you start your business? How long did it take you to get off your feet? And what advice would you give to people thinking about opening a business, particularly okay, cool. in your industry? Mm. Um, I kind of feel like I started my business by accident, where I was working in uh, a book binders. I was employed, and um, it was quite creatively stifling, and it didn't. I didn't enjoy working there. So I left and I didn't know what I was going to do and realised I, I still wanted to learn bookbinding. But because there was nobody employing bookbinders, I could only do it for myself. And I just ended up getting a few clients and then I got more clients and then suddenly I was buying equipment and I needed a bigger studio. Um, and it kind of happened quite... Looking back, it happened organically, but at the time it felt like such a struggle. Mm. And yeah, my, my biggest challenge was um, confidence and sort of self-assurance and feeling like I was allowed to do things. Um, mm. So it took me a while to get over that. It took me ages to get over that. Um, and I think it took me about a year and a half of, I was working um, in, a, in Tapa in the East End, the, <laughs> the, the, the organic bakery. I was working yeah. there part-time. Um, and I think I was working for about a year and a half before I had, I think it's with, with the way of a lot of businesses where you end up with a part-time job that's supporting the work that you want to be doing, but then the part-time work gets in the way of the work that you want to be doing. And that's when you know it's time to sort of get rid of the security net, which is terrifying, <laughs> so scary. But you know, if you do that, it doesn't work out. You can always get another job. Usually, mm -hmm. maybe not in COVID times, don't quit your job. <laughs> 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 um, so yeah, what, what, how did it take you on my feet? So it took me, yeah, it took me about a, oh, I don't know, like it took me maybe six months to get my first client, and from there it just went, uh, it got busier and busier, and then it was maybe like a year and a half before I went full time self employed. Mm -hmm. um, what advice to people starting a job in bookbinding? Learn as much as you can. What employed, you know, if you can get a job. Uh, as a traineeship in a boundary or if you're interested in print or whatever try and learn as much as you can while being employed and about where to get suppliers from and how to do things quickly and efficiently and mm -hmm. then go off and do it your own so that question was actually from reese hole so thanks reese well, just because it's for some reason it, your, your name has not fed through yeah. onto the feed mysterious um, reese you're now known as linkedin user reese so uh. <laughs> so just because we've only got a couple of minutes left Julian, so what have you what are your goals for the future what mm. i mean survive covid keep That's the business helpful. don't yeah. give in to existential dread too much yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, i my goal for this year for the business was to focus more on fine bindings so that's the fancy ones i was talking about where it's all my design and um hopefully a collector will will take the book and make it their own and that's something that i still want to do more of and that's something that i have a bit more time to do now so i want to focus more on fine binding um and maybe design some more products because I did a wee studio sale there on Friday and it went really well and it was so nice that people wanted wee books so I might make some more of them. I think you should. I think you should. Yeah, I kind of want one. Uh, yeah. Cool. Three sales really... right here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like my goal should be loftier. Um, more than <laughs> four Just sales. Just it through. Just survive. Five. <laughs> <laughs> well Jillian thank you so much you've been an absolute delight to talk to um, thanks for joining us on this Tuesday evening and thanks to everyone else that's come along and spent this uh, hour with us um, if you want to find out more about Jillian you can find her on Instagram at juju J-U-J-U J -U, J -U, dot books and on her website which is Jillian Stewart dot co dot uk which is down there on the bottom um i've changed our website it's now jujubooks.co.uk sorry i see that there i see it. Sorry, I think that's an old one that's on my sorry <laughs> sorry that's my fault <laughs> no, no. so jujubooks.co.uk <laughs> uh, 
Um, yes. If you've enjoyed this session and you want to go back and watch it again, you can do because we'll be saving them on here on LinkedIn. We'll be also popping them on the Creative Entrepreneurs Club website, which is Rachel's website, and they'll be on the Made Brave um, YouTube channel. We're here every two weeks. Um, it comes around in a week, weirdly enough. It comes around, it feels like a week every time, but it is two weeks. Every two weeks, Rachel and Rachel comes and joins us. Um, from the Creative Entrepreneurs Club. So um, if you want to follow and see our next session, make sure follow Creative Entrepreneurs Club and you'll get their wee notifications or follow Made Brave. A uh, big thank you to Keenan here for helping us out and facilitating and setting us up with all our live stream magic. Um, and thanks for everyone for coming out. We'll see you next time. See you next time. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.